Uh, we'll talk about 2024, where um, we also have very interesting climate conditions coming together. And then we'll look at some longer term trends and what's been going on um, over the last, say, 35 years for tropical cyclones. Um, so this goes back to a pay or goes to a paper that's currently under review in the in for the bulletin of the AMS um, with a great cast of uh, colleagues who have really really helped uh, with kind of um, running some of the model simulations and really kind of fine tuning the science. And there still are a few things that I think are somewhat open questions. Carl and I were just talking about that even a few minutes ago. Um, but I kind of want to set the stage for the 2023 season, and we're going to start by looking at a plot of sea surface temperature anomalies um, in February of last year. So this is kind of when we're starting to get into our seasonal forecast mode in CSU. We put out our first forecast in early April. So we have two boxes highlighted. That blue rectangle denotes the Nino 3.4 region, which is the region that NOAA uses to classify or, or to classify ENSO uh, half a degree Celsius or more. It's El Nino, half a degree Celsius or more negative. It's La Nina. Um, and that red rectangle denotes the main development region in the Atlantic, so named because it's the main region where hurricanes form in the Atlantic. Um, so if we look at in February of last year, we see there's a little bit of blue in the Pacific. So we're still kind of in the last vestiges of that, La Nina, that really prolonged La Nina event. And if you look at the Atlantic main development region, um, you know, it's kind of like what you want to see with your uh, MRI. It's unremarkable. You know, really nothing going on. It's pretty much dead on average. So when we did, came to our seasonal forecast in early April, we said, oh, wow, you know, you've got like a pretty robust El Nino. And so this is... Uh, the forecast last March for the Nino 3.4 region from the ECMWF. Um, we can see that almost all ensemble members are calling for El Nino, a lot greater than one, which is moderate, greater than one and a half is generally considered a strong. And you can see the blue line denotes the uh, observed value, which is on the high end of the ensemble, but within the spread. Um, and this was kind of a bit of a surprise because the last, since about 2017, the euro in general has been too hot. Um, and this year, that this past year, they're actually too cold. Um, for El Nino. So, you know, historically, uh, this is a plot that Dr. Gray would have shown 15, 20 years ago, Bill Gray, the founder of the forecast, uh, the seasonal forecast, you know, kind of highlighting what we know about El Nino, La Nina, and Atlantic hurricanes. In general, El Nino is bad for hurricanes because it increases your vertical wind shear. And so in the Atlantic, your low level winds generally blow out of the east. These are the trade winds. At upper levels, high up in the atmosphere, they blow out of the west. So if we think about this in a vertical cross section, you have vertical shear, too much vertical shear tilts the hurricane circulation. You don't get the pressure fall you need that you need to get the wind acceleration and you generally end up with a quieter hurricane season. Whereas La Nina, you tend to get much less vertical wind shear due to changes in the walker circulation, which we'll talk a little bit more about as we move ahead with our discussion of the 2023 hurricane season. Um, so knowing this, you know, a lot of this initial seasonal forecast for last year, likely El Nino, kind of anemic Atlantic, and a pretty quiet hurricane season. But then something really uh, interesting happened. The subtropical ridge in the Atlantic basically went away. Uh, subtropical high got extremely weak, and it was persistently weak for several months, uh, which is unusual. Normally, you'll get periods where it goes up and down, but to be that consistently weak is quite surprising. Um, and when you have that weak subtropical high, the pressure changes in the tropics are pretty small, so you have a weaker subtropical to tropical pressure gradient, you get weaker trades, weaker trade winds, mean less evaporation off the ocean surface. Your Atlantic warmed extremely rapidly from kind of near average at the end of February to record warm by June. And so when people ask about climate change, I say climate change can certainly load the dice towards these kind of events. But when something goes from kind of near average to record in four months, that's weather. Um, and so we had just really weak trades. You're talking two meters per second. And there were days where you look at some of the buoy obs and it was calm at 10 or 51, stuff you just never see. Um, and so the Atlantic warmed extremely rapidly. So these are your sea surface temperature anomaly. Sorry, the colors aren't showing up great on this, but there was a lot of warming uh, between March and July, anomalous warming. So warming up a lot faster than normal, about one degree Celsius across the basin, which is a lot in the deep tropics. Um, and so by the time we got to July, Here's what we have. We had a record warming development region, a strong El Nino. And so we kind of call past this season as a clash of the titans between, you know, which one was going to win. Uh, record warm Atlantic, which generally should favor more active hurricane seasons, more um, basically more energy for storms, as well as lower pressures, or the strong El Nino. And again, the prevailing wisdom historically has been strong El Nino dominates over anything else. Um, but in the case of 2023, you know, our initial seasonal forecast was pretty kind of a little bit below normal 
And then we upped the numbers as we got to June, July, and August because we realized, holy cow, the Atlantic is extremely warm. And so this probably isn't going to be kind of your normal El Nino season in the Atlantic. Um, and certainly when we got to August through October, those conditions tended to persist. We had a strong El Nino, about 1.6 degrees Celsius for August through October, which are the peak three months of the season, but also a record warm Atlantic. And so one of the reasons why we were fairly confident it was going to be a busy season is because we now have climate models that can forecast three to six months out. And those climate models were forecasting a strong El Nino, forecasting a record warm Atlantic, and also forecast low shear. And so theoretically, with your climate model is handling the dynamics of the atmosphere and ocean correctly, you give it the appropriate sea surface temperature forcing, it should be able to get you the actual wind response. And we actually did have a very low shear environment. And the way it's surprising, you didn't get more storms or stronger storms because the shear across the Atlantic was actually quite low in 2023, which again, Bill, Dr. Gray passed away in 2016. I'm sure if you told him we had a strong El Nino and shear that was well below normal, he would have been very, very surprised. But we had you know, a very unusual set of sea surface temperature conditions. And so what we did in this paper, um, which is something that I have not done in the past, but I have some great colleagues that can run these models. Um, we looked at this from a modeling perspective. And so again, I'm sorry that these blues aren't really showing up, but what we wanted to do first was we're going to try to use the, um, the community atmosphere model, which is the atmosphere component of the community or system model, to try and see, okay, can, you know, what was driving the for what was driving the low shear. So I wanted to obviously make sure first, did it replicate the shear pattern that we actually had? And not perfect, but did a reasonably good job. Trust me, there are blues in the drop in the main development region. It did generally get lower than normal shear. So then we wanted to see was, okay, well, let's see, let's play around with various sea surface temperature configurations and see how the shear response changed. Um, so we first said, let's set the, Let's basically take the sea surface temperatures everywhere around the globe as what they were in 2023, but we're going to say the Atlantic was dead on average. Um, so what would happen if the Atlantic had been normal, uh, but we still had a strong El Nino? And unsurprisingly, guess what? Now we got a whole lot of shear in the main development region and a pretty likely a pretty quiet hurricane season. Um, then we basically did the opposite and said we'll make the Pacific the same. So Nino 3-4, the anomaly is zero by definition. The Atlantic is extremely warm, and no surprise. Very, very low wind shear across the tropical Atlantic, again, what we would expect. And so then what we said was, okay, well, that's not Bill surprising. There's been papers that have kind of shown that, and that's kind of intuitive based on what we know about hurricanes. But let's try and see, let's get in and see, you know, was it something that's specific about the configuration of the sea surface temperature pattern in the Pacific that made it the way it was? And so the way that we did this is we said we have um, we use the ERA-5, which is a reanalysis from the European Center. We use the Kind of the global satellite coverage era so since 79 so we took all moderate strong el nino events since 1979 but not including 2023 and we said okay we're going to use the composite of that and then run the shear and see what the shear is like um so the the um sst anomalies in 2023 were somewhat different from kind of your canonical el nino we didn't get cooling in the western tropical pacific like we normally do which i think played somewhat of a role in why the Western North Pacific season was so wonky last year in terms of typhoons. Uh, we also had a cold Pacific decadal oscillation pattern. So normally in a strong El Nino, um, your water temperature anomalies near Hawaii are warmer than normal, even though it looks like it's white here. It is generally a little bit warmer than normal. Last year, they were actually quite cold. Um, and so that was something else that was going on. So I wanted to see, well, how did that change the, 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 um, uh, the shear response? And at least in the CAM model, which I still struggle a little bit with this result, but the CAM model showed actually a stronger reduction in shear with the kind of your canonical El Nino than what we actually had last year. That could potentially be because when you average moderate and strong El Ninos, they were overall magnitude was a little bit lower. Um, also last year had a lot of sea warm SSTs off the coast of Africa, or I'm sorry, off the coast of South America that may have altered the shear pattern a little bit. So this is kind of stuff that we're still not quite sure about exactly why that was the case, but certainly um, last year wasn't kind of your canonical El Nino pattern. I think that's important when we're looking at ENSOs and responses in the future. We want to be very cognizant that it's not just the Nino 3-4 region, it's this whole broad Pacific SSD pattern that matters. And so last year, because the SSTs near Hawaii were so cold, which is not normal for an El Nino, like the Hawaii didn't have much in the way of impacts, there were several storms that basically were headed that direction and basically died by the 26 degree isotherm as they approached Hawaii. Uh, but certainly last year was a busy hurricane season overall. 
Um, but you will note that a lot of the storms last year were in the eastern and central part of the basin. Thankfully, from an impacts perspective, it was pretty benign. Uh, the one significant hurricane that made landfall in Dahlia, made landfall um, in the Big Bend region of Florida, which, while well, they certainly had very significant impacts, it's a fairly sparsely populated part of the coastline. Taylor County, where it made landfall, is about 20,000 people. So from an overall damage and impacts to the larger scale economy, not massive and thankfully also a fairly low loss of life. I'll talk a little more about Edalia um, here in a minute. Um, so the 2023 season got off to a bang. We had uh, three storms in June, including two in the main development region, which is the first time that had occurred. And there was a lot of discussion, holy cow, what are, what are we in for in 2023? But then it got quiet. Um, and it got really quiet through about the middle part of August. And there was a lot of kind of discussion. Is the season a dud? You know, we're about August 17th, 18th, 19th, not no storms. But um, then things really, really took off. And we went to an extremely uh, busy period for the latter part of August through most of September. Finished with a fairly uh, average October and a quiet November. Uh, but the bell rings on the 20th of August. This is Dr. Bill Gray ringing a bell. Uh, he used to ring it every year on August 20th. And that's because... That's about when the time the climatological peak of the hurricane season begins. And you can see that looking at this nice schematic from NOAA. Um, you can see a big jump about the middle of the latter part of August. And that's kind of the time where earlier on you can have a lot of dust and dry air coming off of Africa. That tends to start to get mixed out by the time you get to mid-August. Your sea surface temperatures are getting warmer, so your thermodynamics are getting more favorable. Shear tends to be lowest climatologically in about mid to late August, and it starts to escalate. So basically, August 20th is about the time your thermodynamics generally get favorable enough. And then September 10th, which is the peak of the season historically, it's about the time where the shear is getting stronger at a faster rate that, that is becoming less favorable than the SSTs that are still continuing to warm through about the end of September. But you can see just how, um, you know, the, best, the storms are ready for the bell to ring last year. This is the tropical weather outlook on uh, August 19th. It looks like a kid just like scrawling with a crayon. We had five systems that they were monitoring at the same time, and all five of these eventually did form. And it got really, really busy in a hurry. Uh, here's a satellite loop on August the 30th. So on the far left, we have Hurricane Idalia making landfall in the Big Bend. That giant donut northwest of Bermuda is Hurricane Franklin. Uh, farther to the south and east, we had uh, the second rendition of GERT was brewing. Um, GERT got sheared uh, once and then came back and then got uh, sheared again. Um, and then to the far right, we have uh, what would become Tropical Storm Jose. So things got busy in a real hurry. And we had two major hurricanes in the western, um, between west of 65 west at the same time, which is pretty unusual. Um, Idalia, again, was the biggest story of the year uh, from an impacts perspective. But you will see as it's making landfall, its eyes kind of ragged. It was going through an eyewall replacement cycle. Um, and at the same time, it was getting hit by some southwest release shear. So it, we, it strengthened all the way up to a Category 4 hurricane. But fortunately, right before landfall, we get a fair amount all the way down to a low-end Category 3 hurricane. But it still is the strongest hurricane in the Big Bend since 1950. Uh, a nine-foot storm surge near Cedar Key. Uh, the Big Bend region of Florida, given the coastal bathymetry, is extremely surge-prone. Uh, likely there was up to 12 feet of storm surge based on the modeling data. It just didn't have a lot of observations um, in that area. $3.6 billion in damage, which is a pretty large number given where it made landfall. Just kind of highlighting how, you know, in this day, even when there's not a ton of people, there's not that many places where there's very few people. And there was actually a fair amount of storms from even in places like Carbon Springs. So had Dahlia been, you know, 100 miles farther to the south and west, or sorry, south and east, that 3.6, likely you could probably get rid of that decimal point. You'd be talking more like 35, 40 billion in damage. Um, and eight direct fatalities uh, with Dahlia. Um, so we then tried to dive in and try to figure out what was going on sub-seasonally to kind of drive that really hyperactive period in the Atlantic. And so I think there were a couple of things going on. Uh, we started to get a lot of subsidence over the eastern North Pacific, uh, which is really unusual for an El Nino. And when you get sinking motion, you have upward, uh, upper level convergence, sinking motion down, um, and then um, uh, low level divergence, which basically means you have anomalous low level easterly winds behind it and an almost low of the westerly winds or sorry to the east of it which means you have reduced shear in the atlantic we also tend to get kind of a break in the subsidence over the indian ocean um forcing more air up over there which also tends to increase your upper level easterly winds over the atlantic and that's kind of one of the big things we look for and dr gray before we could measure low level winds really accurately used to always use the upper level winds when those when you get anomalous easterlies that's when you tend to really get stuff going to town. You're getting a good upper-level anti-cyclone over the tropical Atlantic. 
Um, and you can see on this plot, here we're highlighting the main development region in the Hobmuller from August 1st to October 30th. You see there's a lot of blue, uh, especially from about the end of August through October. Uh, we just had a lot of really low shear, which favored a lot of these storm formations. Fortunately, though, even though we had a lot of storm formations, most of these storms recurred in the eastern and central Atlantic because that same weak subtropical ridge had generated all that warm water. Uh, also tend to allow for more recurvature of storms. You didn't have, basically, the ridge was weak, so storms tend to gain latitude and recurve. So from an impacts perspective, fortunately, you know, not particularly impactful, but I think from a scientific perspective, there's a lot that we really can learn uh, from the 2023 season. And I'm sure the reviewers will tell us there's a lot more that we should be learning from the 2023 season, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but I do want to talk, switch gears a little bit and talk about 2024, because uh, it's coming down the pike, and I have to say it was probably about August of last year, I was having some conversations with friends at the Hurricane Center with Carl and saying, you know, okay, this is what we have last, this year. Can we imagine, can you imagine next year, because that El Nino is likely to be gone, what's going to happen in 2024, given the, how warm the Atlantic is. Um, and so, you know, we started talking about 2024, and so a lot of people think this is how our forecasts are put out. This is uh, Dr. Bill Gray looking into his crystal ball, saying, barely, I see 17 these storms. You know, it's not how we do it. We're not, I don't, not like my meteorological namesake, the groundhog, Constantine Phil, waking up in the morning to look and see if we can see our shadow. Uh, we use a lot of historical weather and climate data to come up with these forecasts. So we have two kind of primary techniques. We have statistical models, which are basically take data up through, so for our April forecast, data up through March, and look historically which areas have worked well, say, in the winter at predicting hurricane activity the following summer. Something else that Dr. Gray did not have access to, which we do now, is climate models. And so we're not looking for a forecast for a specific day, but you can use climate models to say forecast what's going to happen with ENSO, what's going to happen with the Atlantic. And they're not perfect by any means, but they're not bad. And they not, a lot of these climate models have a 30 to 40 year high cast period. So we can develop basically what we call statistical dynamical models. So we use the climate model to forecast the large scale environment. And then assuming that forecast is correct, then you will forecast kind of the number of storms that come out of that. And so with that, our forecast still has actually improved. So the blues are, the reds are higher than the blues, which is good. We're getting better at forecasting seasonal hurricane activity. But to see our numbers are not near one, especially in April. Um, and that's because there's a whole lot that can change in the atmosphere ocean system. And even perfect knowledge of the large scale environment does not tell you exactly how your hurricane season is going to play out. Um, perfect knowledge gives you about 60% of the variability. If you can tell us exactly the shear, exactly the water temperatures, there's still unexplained variance because hurricanes are weather events and you're trying to forecast them on climate high scales. So there's just other stuff that comes into play and you know exactly how the storms progress off of Africa and how they're interacting with each other. A lot of this stuff that comes in. So you're never going to get seasonal forecast scale of one, but our forecast scale is improving. And as you would expect, this, the scale also improves from April to June to August because we're closer to the events we're trying to predict. And while the hurricane season starts June 1st, it really doesn't ramp up, as we talked earlier, until around August 20th. So we put out a forecast it's around the 5th of August, and you still got about 95% of your major hurricane activity to go. So I'll some will say that's like putting out a forecast at halftime. It's more like putting out a forecast after the first drive of the game. So our forecast in early April was, was big. This is the biggest forecast we put out with our April outlooks. Uh, 23 storms, 11 hurricanes, five major category three, four, five hurricanes. Um, and also an ACE of 210, which is well above the long-term average. So ACE is an integrated metric accounting for storm frequency, intensity, and duration. So long live major hurricanes like an Irma or an Ivan or a Dorian generate tons of ACE. Weak, short-lived pieces of crap, scientific term, generate very low levels of ACE. One thing that we started doing last year was forecasting ACE west of 60 degrees west. And the reason why is because the eastern half of the basin impacts ships, but in general, there's not much land, so not many people impacted. The western half of the basin is obviously where pretty much everybody lives. Um, and so we wanted to kind of highlight ACE in the western half of the basin because that's basically what we call angst ACE. That's where people are not happy. They're flying a lot of planes into these storms. People are definitely not happy when you get storms in the western half of the basin. And so a lot of people are like, well, you should, can you forecast how many hurricanes are going to hit Texas? No, I can't. But you can do the western half of the basin. You're starting to get to a more impactful metric. And it doesn't necessarily um, scale with the same percentage of basin-wide ACE every year. In general, you get more ACE west of 60 in La Nina years because, one, your Caribbean is more conducive for storm formation, but also you tend to have a slightly stronger subtropical high that develops once La Nina gets entrenched, which tends to push the storms a bit farther west. Stronger in the winter than it is in the summer, like many things, 
but there's a little bit of uh, information there as well. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, so here's our current sea surface temperature anomaly pattern. So if we look at that blue rectangle, that Nino 3.4 region, we're still above normal, but that warmth is truly skin deep, and I'll show that in just a minute. Um, the main development region is still record warm. Uh, the record warm anomalies have come down a little bit, but they're still well, well above average. And even if we warmed at the slowest observed rate in the satellite era for the main development region, we would be the fourth warmest on record trailing last year, 2010 and 2005. So still very, very, very hot, even if things went um, a lot less warm than we would expect. If we look at the tropical Pacific in more detail, again, you can see generally it's still a fair amount of yellow, but the upper ocean heat content has gone cold. Um, so if you look right beneath the ocean surface, there's a lot of cold water. And there's a pretty significant right now upwelling oceanic Kelvin wave coming across the tropical Pacific Ocean. That combined with very strong or stronger than normal trades this is the latest forecast from the European Center, um, should basically cause significant upwelling, bringing that cold water up to the ocean surface. And likely, I would say, we're likely to be out of El Nino within a couple of weeks. Um, it's definitely going to be cold in a hurry. Um, one thing I think that's interesting is that here we're looking at the 46-day forecast from the European Center. And obviously, there's going to be more noise in this pattern than what we see, because the model, once you get beyond a couple of weeks, starting to average out all the different sub-seasonal stuff. But to me, that model is saying we're in La Nina because basically it has strong trades for the entire time. So the background state is becoming more La Nina-like, and Noah noted in their ENSO forecast that they just put out a few days ago that for the atmosphere is actually kind of leading the ocean, and that the ocean still says La Nina, but the atmosphere is already looking more neutral, um, which is usually it seems like it goes the other way, but that's um, what's what's transpiring. So I suspect not necessarily a strong La Nina, but I would suspect. Minus 0 0.7, minus 0 0.8, somewhere around there, weak to moderate on La Nina by the peak of the hurricane season. Um, the official forecast from NOAA has an 80% chance of landing in for August through October, which are the peak three months of the season. Um, about 20% of neutral, I think 1% for El Nino. Um, obviously, there's tons of models forecasting this stuff. If we look at the North American multi model ensemble, uh, which is seven models from the United States, from the US and Canada. Um, basically, what we see is that all of them are calling for La Nina by the peak of the season. I think in general, it doesn't necessarily matter a ton if we go officially to La Nina. If we have cool neutral and a stream warm Atlantic, we can still get a very, very busy season. Some of the busiest Atlantic seasons on record have not had La Nina. They've had cool neutral and snow conditions, 2005 being uh, probably the most classic example of that. And why we care is because we do get a whole lot more storms in the Atlantic based on ENSO phase. Uh, here's looking at La Nina, neutral and El Nino. Here we're going back to 1900. Um, and even though the number of storms may be underestimated going back in time, La Nina and El Nino events have kind of occurred evenly throughout the record. So the ratio should be relatively good. So a couple of takeaways from this, obviously you get more in La Nina than in El Nino, but the ratios are stronger for stronger storms. So you get a bigger ratio for major hurricanes and for major storms. A lot of that is due to you can get a marginal storm in a pretty marginal environment. But to get a major hurricane, you need to have a larger area with more conducive conditions. And that's what you're much more likely to see in a La Nina than you are in an El Nino. So if you plot the tracks of the major hurricanes, certainly I'd much rather be in the red than in the blue if I'm living along the coast. A whole lot more storms. You see a lot more tracks in the Caribbean. Again, where the shear is a lot more conducive, uh, a lot more storms hitting the United States. But you'll see, you know, with El Nino, there's still a fair number going between Texas and Alabama. But once you shift farther east, really very little signal in that region. And that's really where we see the big differences. We look for Texas to Alabama. We do see more in La Nina than in El Nino, but the ratios aren't particularly notable. Whereas if we look at uh, Florida, especially for the major hurricanes, it's about two and a half to one. Um, so that's where you really start to see your signal. Um, and I think really what I wanted to drive down was when it comes to what people really care about is damage, right? So one way to look at that is looking at normalized damage, which is the damage that these historical hurricanes that have occurred in the past would cause if they were to make landfall today. And there's a lot of approximations you have to make, but you basically take the observed damage and multiply it by inflation, population, and a wealth per capita kind of metric. And so when you do that and you look at normalized damage by ENSO phase, you know, it's about six to one. For, uh, for the continental US or the CONUS, and about over uh, 10 to one uh, for Florida and the East Coast, so from Florida up to Maine. Uh, you might be wondering what that one year is. 
uh, that was that's in the red for uh, Florida. That was 2004. It might be El Nino threshold, but was still a very, very active season. And I think it's one of those years why we have that 40% unexplained variance. If you take the perfect knowledge of 2004 shear and SSPs and just fit it into a model based on every other year, trying to do a simple regression, it falls. It's a, it's a quote unquote overachieving hurricane season. So there are challenges even with uh, perfect knowledge of the large scale. Uh, but the Atlantic is still very, very warm. Um, here's sea surface temperature anomalies through uh, basically average through the middle part of April. Um, and unfortunately, this kind of pattern of a very warm tropical Atlantic, kind of that warm canary current up towards um, the Iberian Peninsula, up, up towards England, is a classic pattern that has historically been associated with busy hurricane season. So this is a correlation with seasonal accumulated cyclone energy. So if we flip back and forth, not a perfect match, but that's a pattern correlation of like 0.9. Um, so that's very concerning. Um, and it's not just the sea surface temperatures. Brian McFoldy, um, uh, for our former CSU guy, uh, has this graphic here. And again, sorry, this stuff isn't showing up great. But this is a uh, ocean heat content time series. So not just looking at the SSTs, but looking at how warm the temp sea surface temperatures or how warm the water temperatures are deeper down in the ocean. It's really warm. So for the main development region, it's middle of April. Uh, climatologically, we don't get to where we are now until the middle of June. And this is using a 2013 to 2023 climatology, which is a pretty warm climatology. Unfortunately, it's a fairly short time series. But that's obviously quite concerning if we look at the uh, how far ahead we are ahead of schedule. So even if we do get somewhat stronger trades um, over the next week, which I think we will, afterwards it looks like the, the we should be going back to a weaker wind regime and likely going to continue uh, tracking well above normal. Coming up. If we look at forecasts from the North American multi-model ensemble, uh, it's generally very aggressive at La Nina and also a very warm northern tropical Atlantic relative to the southern tropical Atlantic. And that is defined as a positive phase of what's known as the Atlantic meridional mode. Um, so named because it's a mode in the north-south direction. And when it's positive, you have a warm northern tropical Atlantic relative to the southern tropical Atlantic. When you have that warm water, it tends to be associated with lower pressure. So you get more convergent or more basically cross equatorial flow, which then turns from west towards the east. So you get basically more low level vorticity, low level convergence right off the coast of Africa, helping to spin up these waves that are coming off Africa. We look at precipitation anomalies. Uh, I tend to like my color bars flip, but in this case, yellow means higher precip. Um, you get more precipitation off of Africa as well. So an indication of a more vigorous easterly wave track. Um, and so this is generally associated with busier hurricane seasons. So doing a similar analysis to what we did with ENSO, but with the Atlantic Meridional Mode, we can see again, a whole lot more storms when you have the, the Northern Atlantic warm. Um, about three to one difference for major hurricanes. Uh, this time series goes back to 1948. So we took the 19 warmest years. Um, those are positive. The 19 coldest years is negative. All other years are classified as neutral. And we get about a three to one difference. And you can see again, one of the big things is if you look at the main development region, sorry, anywhere east of the islands, there's nothing in a negative AMM. Just because the waters are basically the thermodynamics are just not conducive, but you see a ton of tracks when the AMM is positive. Um, you also will see more storm landfalls, um, you know, basically along the US as well. If you look at Texas to Alabama, again, it's not quite as the, the relationship isn't as strong as it is for Florida to Maine. Um, it's not quite as strong with the AMM as it is with, and so I think because the Atlantic Meridiana mode tends to, tends to really kind of favor storms forming in the eastern part of the basin, and the farther east storms form in general, the lower the odds of them making U.S. landfall, just because the beta effect will tend to pull them a little bit north and increase their odds of recurvature. If we do that same normalized damage estimate, uh, we do see about a six to one difference for Florida and the east coast. Um, and so kind of what I wanted to show next is basically what happens if you combine the two? And unfortunately, I think we'll likely be combining the La Nina and the positive AMM in 2024. So this is kind of like what um, Chris Patricola did uh, probably about 10 years ago now, uh, where you basically say, OK, let's take the various climate modes. So last year, we kind of had the ENSO and the Atlantic kind of pulling the opposite direction. This year, they're likely to be pulling in the same direction. And we can see about a four to one difference for major hurricanes. Uh, when you have the AMM positive with La Nina compared with when the AMM is negative with El Nino. So certainly um, likely a very, very busy season in store. Uh, there's a whole pile of different models that we can use to look at seasonal forecasts. 
Uh, this is an example. This is the latest forecast from the European Center for August through October. Uh, it's a little bit less aggressive for La Nina than a lot of the other models. I think some are due to its initialization when um, it was initialized. There was a fair amount of westerly winds along the equator in the tropical Pacific, and that tends to, DC tends to have a warm bias when that happens. Um, but you can see a cool neutral end, so very warm Atlantic. And so the European Center, in addition to forecasting a large-scale environment, will actually count tropical cyclones if the model spins up. And in the case of the forecast through October, it's calling for a very, very busy Atlantic season. Uh, it's an ensemble, so you can have a decimal point when you average over 51 members. Uh, it's forecasting 10.9 hurricanes through October. Uh, climatology is about 6.9. So a very busy season, close to in line with our forecast. The model only goes out through um, October, which so we don't have November, but in general, November, and maybe at most one hurricane unless you're talking 2020. Uh, this is a precipitation forecast from the European Center. Um, and so in last March, it did do a great job. And as we got more towards April and May, it actually did highlight enhanced precipitation, which in the tropics, you can use as somewhat a proxy for tropical cyclones. By March of last year, it was highlighting a lot of precip, but mostly in the eastern and central Atlantic, whereas this year it's highlighting a ton of precip in the western Atlantic, which is not where we want to see it if we want to avoid seeing hurricanes. Some of this is the classic La Nina kind of signal as well, and a warm Atlantic where you're getting enhanced convection over the Caribbean. Um, so I think really, again, most signals at this point are pointing to a well above average hurricane season. So we run statistical dynamical models off of the European Center, as well as the UK Met Office, JMA, as well as a model from Italy. And all four of those models we ran with March data for our operational forecast. Uh, I ran them again. We ran them again with our April forecast, April data, and they basically didn't change hardly at all, all calling for very hyperactive Atlantic hurricane seasons. We also use analogs, which involves going back into the past and then getting creative with trying to find the years in the past that looked most similar to what we currently see, but really what we expect to see for the peak of the season. Um, and, you know, there's no like snowflakes, there's no two years that are perfectly alike. Uh, but this year was really hard because if it's the warmest Atlantic on record, you don't have an analog for that, right? Because it's the warmest on record. And obviously the, the year that was the previous warmest on record was last year, which is not, we're not going to have El Nino. So we tried to find years in the past that had warm Atlantics and we're trending from El Nino towards La Nina. And there's some leeway just because we don't have a ton of really good examples. But one of the best years that we found was actually going way, way back into the history books, 1878. Um, and, you know, it's hard to know how accurate the sea surface temperature data was in 1878. Uh, the ENSO data is probably pretty good because we have a lot of like historical records from, say, the western part of South America. So we kind of know when they had the big El Ninos. But if we believe the sea surface temperatures in Atlantic was super hot that year, seems likely given how busy the season was. Uh, named storms, which is that first column on the left um, after year, is likely underestimated in 1878 26 because we didn't fly planes, we didn't have satellites. So we can probably tack on four, five, six, whatever to those numbers. But you can see all five of those years were hyperactive Atlantic hurricane seasons. Um, but the, the storms did were very different. And that's the point we try to make. These analogs are looking at the large scale. But 2010 and 2020 are two analogs. 2020 was everything in, almost everything in the Western Atlantic and obviously extremely busy. Gulf of Mexico, the tracks are almost cartoonish how many storms there were. Caribbean was really busy. 2010, super busy season, but very little in the Western Atlantic. So from an impacts perspective, most everything in 2010 recurved. It formed right off of Africa and recurved in the eastern and central part of the basin. So from an impacts perspective, 2010 was a lot less. So again, highlighting how the tracks of the storms is governed a lot by day and day weather, and we just don't have a ton of predictability for that on seasonal time scales. Um, with these seasonal forecasts, obviously there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty, um, especially in April. And so we calculate, um, the uncertainty of our historical errors. And then we basically, you can have uncertainty ranges similar to what NOAA puts out with their seasonal forecast. The reason why we do one number is because uh, if you forecast a range, often what I'll see in the newspaper is they'll take the high end of the range and say up to whatever. So in this case, if they see issue is forecasting up to 14 hurricanes, in which case the general public says that means 14 hurricanes. So by forecast, by giving the midpoint, at least gets people to focus on the number that's your best estimate. And then for those that care about uncertainty, which obviously we do, you can see there's a fair amount of uncertainty. The April forecast the spread is large. As you get to June to August, these spreads get smaller because you're more confident and you have better skill uh, generally with the forecasts. The ace west of 60 this year, the ratio is a bit higher because we are expecting 
um, likely on La Nina. And in general, you get more east west of 60 in La Nina. But you can see it's between like 50% and 60%. But these are massive signals here. And that's one of the things we're going to be working on to see if there's other stuff that we can do to kind of help improve the scale of that east west of 60. Because I think that's at least a good first step at trying to get more useful metrics that general public, or especially like insurance and other emergency managers might find more useful than just saying that the hurricane is going to be busy in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we also do probabilities of landfall. So in this case, obviously, we can't say where storms are going to go, but we can calculate historical probabilities based on um, historical storms. And then what we do is we then adjust the probability based on an east west of 60, since we're predicting an above normal season, the probabilities are elevated. So we have probabilities for having these large, broad swaths. We actually have it at, for each individual state, as well as each individual county along the coast, parishes in Louisiana, all the coastal states of Mexico, every island in the Caribbean. And so what we did here is we selected the storms that we tracked within 50 miles. And the reason why we use a 50 mile buffer is to kind of smooth out some of the signal if you just you know, insist that it make landfall in your county. And obviously, if a hurricane makes landfall in the county next year's, you're probably not having a good day in your county either. The yeah, island may actually be going more through your county than that county. So it helps kind of smooth out the, um, the noise and also increases the sample size. Um, and so that's why we use the 50 mile buffer. You could argue you want easy even 100 miles, but here for this analysis, we did 50 miles. And again, we have us for a large, um, all these different counties, uh, parishes, states, and other countries as well. Um, this is all on our website. I just gave you a few examples here. As you would expect, the probability is highest for the state of Florida, just because biomologically your probability is highest for Florida, because Florida gets hit a lot and also just a very large coast. Obviously, it's a lot less coast in Mississippi to hit than there is in the state of Florida. So we do update the forecast. Uh, next one comes out on June 11th. An additional update on the 9th of July and a final update on the 6th of August. Um, and then we'll put in a verification on the 26th of November. And sometimes a verification is more enjoyable to write than others if the forecast goes well or poorly. Um, but it's important to verify your forecast and really important to go in and try to figure out what the heck happened. Um, because no matter how, if you even have a perfect forecast where you hit the numbers right on, stuff doesn't always play out the way you expect. There's always a storm that does something weird or subseasonally things go haywire, like just even if the numbers come up right, there's always things that make you scratch your head. 2021 is a good example. It's one of our best forecasts. But it was gangbusters for September that season shut off in a, in a La Nina, warm Atlantic, just shut off in October. I don't think really anyone knows exactly why, but it just shut off. And so there's always these things that make you scratch your head. Um, and so we try to do verifications to kind of understand better. And if we did have a forecast that did not verify well, go into detail explaining why we think it didn't verify well, and obviously also trying to better model what happened and better not. Basically, we're going to make mistakes again, but not make the same mistake again. Make a different mistake the next time. Um, and so lastly, what I want to talk with you about is some longer term trends in tropical cyclone activity. And this is a paper that we published uh, over two years ago now. And it was looking at trends in tropical cyclone activity since 1990. Um, the paper was for 2021. Those plots are all updated through 2023. Uh, thanks to the great work that the IB Tracks team does. Um, all this data is nice and easy to um, run numbers with. And so what I wanted to do was there's been a lot of papers that look at trends and storms and not a ton that have done it globally, but oftentimes these papers have kind of mismatched periods that the data is not necessarily very good. Um, as you go back in time, the data just gets less of, of less high quality. Satellite data, as you go back, just gets of lower quality. Um, and we had fewer satellites. We didn't have directly overlooking satellites. So storms were looking at them at an oblique angle. They just look weaker. Um, and we don't have the we don't have the nice uh, aircraft reconnaissance we have in the Atlantic. And it's not to say that stuff hasn't gotten better since 1990. Certainly it has. I would argue for most things except maybe music. Um, but um, in general, you know, satellite data since 1990, a hurricane in 1990, we, hurricanes today would probably still have been classified as hurricanes in 1990. Um, so what we wanted to do was look at a period of reasonably consistent satellite, um, a reasonably good observational period. So we, we started in 1990 with this analysis, and we looked at a whole pile of different metrics, and I'm just going to overview a few in the last few minutes of this presentation. Um, first of all, we look at the number of, of named storms. So these are any systems named, and here we're using the U.S. Warning Agency, so we're using the National Hurricane Center and the Joint Typhoon Warning Center. Um, and so if we go back to 1990, we see it's basically a flat line, maybe an ever so slight increasing trend. But what's interesting to note is that we actually have a very big increasing trend in the short-lived named storms. And it's really 
uh, mostly in the Atlantic and in the Eastern North Pacific. There are these big increasing trends. And while I drew a linear trend from 1990, if you eyeball it, you'd say, really? It's about 03, 04, where suddenly stuff really jumps up. And so there's a lot of question, is this real or is this due to better observations? And I think a lot of this is just due to better observations. And one observational tool that really did come in is scatterometry. Um, and scatterometry is extremely helpful at being able to detect the circulated satellite borne uh, um, satellite borne instruments that measure surface winds. So they can one tell us if the circulation is close. So basically it has winds uh, blowing from all four different quadrants and also how strong those winds are. So some of these storms which may be kind of anemic looking from, from a Dvorak satellite estimates, which is historically how they've been done. If the scatterometer says 35 that winds, often those will be that upgraded to tropical storms. So these are storms, they're just stuff we didn't have the ability to observe even 20, 30 years ago. So while I said it's a reasonably consistent period for the weaker storms, we still have these improvements in observations. And again, obviously, you know, 20, 30 years from now, we'll be observing these even much better. Like hopefully a lot more scatterometers, more frequent passes, all this great stuff. Uh, but it's important when you're looking at that people say, oh, you know, it set the record for the most storms in a year. Well, some of that is like you just do the better observation. So well, that's why we forecast so many different metrics to kind of try to toss up a kind of a broad suite of what's going on in a season. But I think more interesting is the number of hurricanes and typhoons is actually trended downward. And it's significantly downward, primarily due to the Western North Pacific, where it's where there are the typhoons. Uh, we've gone from about 20 per year in the early 90s down to about 12, um, it's really a noticeable one. If I were to show you accumulated cyclone energy and just do a linear trend, it's gone down 40% in the last 35 years. So that's a lot. Um, and a lot of this uh, is this is what's kind of driving the global tropical cyclone trends because the Western North Pacific is climatologically your busiest basin and the stronger the storm, the higher the percentage normally occurs in the Western North Pacific. And one of the biggest kind of debates, I think in tropical meteorology right now is what the heck's going on with ENSO? Um, sorry, this map looks like garbage. Maybe look at those plots because you can actually see the blues and the oranges. Um, just, well, just so you know, it's showing up online well. For okay, cool, but cool. Okay, good, good. So yeah, if you look at the tropical Pacific, you'll see blue, um, and everywhere else is pretty much warming. So we have that nice global warming on well, at night. We have that global warming trend, but it's not warming in the eastern and central tropical Pacific. So from a um, dynamic perspective, we have a more La Nina-like basic state. So we're seeing long live La Nina's, not that La Nina's are getting weaker, but just fewer of them. Um, and La Nina, while it increases your Atlantic storms, tends to really knock down your Northwest Pacific storms, your East and North Pacific storms, your South Pacific storms, tends to shift the monsoon trough a bit farther north, shorter lifetimes over the warm ocean, fewer major hurt or super typhoons, less ace, less overall uh, storm activity there. So this is one of the big questions I think we need to get a hold of is most climate models say El Ninos are going to be more frequent in the future. We're going to have, and it's going to be that trend in the out. The real world says this is the opposite. And this is looking, this paper went to 1990. If you were to go back to 1980, you'd see a very similar trend. So this is beyond probably what you could say is just a natural variability blip. Um, so this is one of the biggest things I think we need to get a hold of because we're looking at projections of pretty much everything. We got to know what the basic state of ENSO is going to be like in the future until we get a hold on that. It's critical even for global temperature trends in the future. At the same time as the percentage or the number of category or the number of hurricanes is going down, the category four or five hurricane percentage, so here we're talking hurricanes, typhoons, et cetera, is going up. Um, so we kind of have, again, this tug of war between typhoons and hurricanes dropping, cat four or five percentage going up. The number of cat four or five since 1990 is basically a flat line, just more of them occurring in the Atlantic, fewer occurring in the Pacific. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of kinds of questions as to what about um, storm intensity and intensification rates? So the historical kind of canonical definition of rapid intensification is 35 miles per hour or more in a day. So a low end tropical storm one day, 40 mile an hour winds, 24 hours later, 75 mile an hour winds. Um, so that's kind of your garden variety rapid intensification. Not much of a trend there. But if we up the ante and say, let's talk about the storms that went berserk. Um, and so Otis from last year would be a great example of the storm that just went completely out of its mind over the course of the day. Um, we see a, a significant increasing trend in that quantity. And you could argue a little bit of this, maybe due to improved observations, we're able to kind of better kind of, um, with, even with satellites, better better be able to see pinnal eyes and things like that. But I think some of this is physical. And I, a lot of this kind of goes back to what we expect with climate change, whether whatever you're looking at is, it's the tails of the distribution where you see the big changes. It's not 
even maybe the 90th percentile, but you have like the 99th percentile or 99.9th percentile. That's where you see the most significant trends. Um, so we do see an increasing trend in this quantity of super rapidly intensifying hurricanes, and likely that's due to just basically warmer sea surface temperatures. But basically, that's that is that is going. You're going to see a stronger trend in that, but you also look at potential intensity, which is basically temperatures throughout the atmosphere. And overall, um, you're likely that the atmosphere is just basically thermodynamically more conducive for storms and the storms to ramp up quite rapidly. Um, but lastly, one thing I wanted to talk about was just trends and losses, because this is something that gets talked about a lot. Um, and people will look at this and say, this has to be climate change, right? And I think really when you're looking for climate change trends, let's look at you know the actual physical events as opposed to like the what happens from them, because obviously, as Dr. Gray would say, it's a whole can of worms and start getting the losses because a lot of different things impact the losses. So not to say this is not important and certainly something we need to be very concerned about because we have a whole lot of losses from storms these days. But if we're going to look at trends, we need to basically normalize the damage. So as I mentioned briefly before, take into account changes in population, inflation, as well as wealth, um, and then try to basically say, okay, if these historical hurricanes were to come around again, how much damage would they do? Because we know stuff has really changed. So for the East Coast, uh, about 50 million more people in coastal counties. You can see a lot of Florida in red, places in Texas in red, over a million more people in some of these coastal counties. So there's a lot more to use insurance parlance exposure along coastal counties to these hurricanes. Um, there's a lot more people and a lot more stuff in harm's way. A lot of this growth has even taken place since 1970-ish when air conditioning became affordable. So it became a lot nicer to live in places like Texas and Florida in the summertime. Um, in the 70s and 80s and in the early 90s, the Atlantic was generally pretty quiet. So we didn't have a lot of hurricanes scaring people away either. So people kept moving to the coast in droves. Um, and then obviously in recent years, we've seen the return of the landfalling hurricane um, with great gusto and obviously a lot more damage. So just as a brief example, I want to go back to the 26th Great Miami Hurricane. It was a Category 4 hurricane, slammed into downtown Miami, caused a lot of damage. There's a bunch of boats that are brought up on the shore. Uh, you can't read the, in the font, but it says uh, Miami's new dry dock courtesy of the hurricane of 1926. Uh, about a 12 to 14 foot estimated storm surge with that hurricane. But, you know, if we go back to 1926, Miami didn't count it a little bit different. About 100,000 people, one hotel on Miami Beach. Uh, thanks to the folks at Google, you can have a pretty much the same, looking at the exact same area today. You know, one or two different buildings. Um, and, you know, there's stuff being built along the coast every day. Uh, you're seeing these, these, these skyscrapers and high rises being built. So this storm is estimated to be the historical storm since 1900 that if it were to recur today, we do the most damage. Uh, estimated now to be about a $200 billion hurricane. Um, so these is kind of a very simple approach using population, inflation, and wealth. Uh, one thing that we're working on now is looking at incorporating some building codes because $200 billion, I think, may be a bit high at this point because the buildings that are being built today are being built better and being built stronger. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them are very low at very low elevation, which that's not going to help a ton, but at least from a wind perspective, they're going to survive a lot better. And we certainly have seen that in places like Miami, even though Irma made landfall on the West Coast. You had 80, 90, maybe 100 mile an hour gusts in Miami, and the structures held up quite well. We did see all the windows getting blown out, like we saw in Houston with Hurricane Ike in 2008. So I think better building codes should hopefully mitigate the damage from the future storms, at least in places like Florida, where the building codes are quite strong. So if we look at the damage from hurricanes back to 1900 using a normalization approach, basically it's a flat line, which is kind of what you would expect because the observed number of U.S. landfalling hurricanes is a flat line. And the observed U.S. number of landfalling major hurricanes is also a flat line since 1900. And obviously, thankfully, the sample size of these is fairly small, so it's going to take a longer time to detect climate change trends, natural variability trends, once you start getting into Thankfully, events that normally are zero or one. Um, obviously, you know, if we start seeing more years or four, then we got some real problems. But with climate change, obviously, you know, the biggest question everyone wants to know is are storms going to get stronger? And I think the answer is yes. Probably not a, a ton stronger, but a little bit stronger. But I think some of the tertiary impacts, I think, are what we really more can be concerned about. What well, I mean, sea level rise. You know, 10 inches of sea level rise to me in Colorado or even in Nashville probably doesn't seem like much of a problem. But when you're living along the coast, that can be a big problem in terms of inundation. Um, so when the storm surge comes on shore, it penetrates farther inland. Six inches of water can be, a salt water can be enough to condemn a house depending on how it plays out. So 
you know, with that continued sea level increase, and that's probably, if anything, just going to keep um, going up, but even at a faster rate, that's going to be a big problem, even if storms didn't change at all. Um, we also do know that storms are likely to bring more rainfall in the future, just simply due to the fact that warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture. Um, so that's a big problem. Uh, so here we're looking at frequencies of high intensity rainfall events. So this is looking at like a Harvey-like storm, and you can see that the storm total rainfalls, uh, basically return periods of high end rainfall events are going to get shorter. So we're going to see, you know, 100 year return periods today, maybe, you know, 80 year or 60 year return periods, uh, you know, 50, 100 years from now. Um, there's also a big question, are storms slowing down? We don't have time to go into down, down into that today, but obviously if storms do slow down, longer residence time over a small area or over an area would mean more rainfall. Um, I think the evidence would argue probably storms will slow down a little bit, but it's hard to know exactly how much that's going to occur. But also likely storms will get a bit stronger um, as we continue to warm the oceans. Um, even though you warm the atmosphere at a higher rate, overall the potential intensity likely will go up a little bit. So we're likely to see kind of a shift in this distribution towards stronger storms. There's obviously a ton of year-to-year -year variability. So detecting these kinds of trends may take a while, but I think likely in, at the end of the day, we'll be seeing more of these high-end um, intense storms. Also, in addition to all that, we also have changes just in the, in, the, in the Gulf environment. So as you concrete more areas, even if the rain's the same as it was before, the more area you have of concrete, the less area you have available for runoff, you get more flooding. Um, so even if the rain doesn't change, you may get more flooding just because, or especially more flash flooding if you have more concrete. Um, and so with that, uh, thanks so much. Um, happy to answer any questions. And if you want to get in touch with me, here's a few ways. So thank you. Thank you. I think we have some time for some questions. If there's any in the room, uh, I know a lot of the folks here in the uh, Earth Systems Data Science class learning all about AI and ML uh, modeling, and so a lot of your forecasting techniques uh, will probably sound similar to what some of them were aren't have been learning about these. I have questions. Oh, you got have questions. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, and I can probably ask multiple questions. Go for it. I'll, I'll go with. For your analogs, um, when you're looking at the really historical data, what if you looked at it like with the climatology for that storm? So like that uh, storm back in 18, I forget the year, but um, like the storm surrounding it, how much stronger was it compared to those other years that were around it? Okay, so are you asking basically like like the, the characteristics of the storms in those analog years? So, so like. So, like when you were looking at that storm, you were comparing it to like, okay, we, we have. Oh, the Great Miami Hurricane, the 26 one. Or like for the forecast for this year. Uh -huh. And you had a storm that you were looking at back in like 18. I, I yeah, 1878. 1878, okay. yeah. So, like compared to the storm, the. I mean, I mean, I know that that data isn't going to be complete, but relative. That that year is probably as complete as the years that are around it. Mm -hmm. So if you look at that year compared to the years that are around it, how much did that year stick? Oh, got it, got it. Yes, yeah. So 1878, from an activity perspective, was well, well, well above the kind of the average for that time period because you look at basically we had very few observations, so everything was in the western half of the basin. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I played around with like. As there's there's published estimates of like missed storms and missed hurricanes based on as best they can tell. Um, I played around with like missing A's, so that that 188 is probably more like 220. Um, so the number of storms of 12, it's hard to know, but yeah. probably at least or it's hard to say for sure. But likely when you look at when you look at the ace in or whatever number in 1878 compared to the years that are around it, it was well well above normal. It was one of the first like busy. So the hurricane data set goes back to 1851, but there's really very few storms in it until you get to like the 1870s, because uh, I think it was the Signal Service Corps. I think 1878 was the first year they started tracking that stuff more consistently. Prior to that, it was just kind of whatever. And obviously, the U.S. was a little busy with other stuff in the early 1860s, um, fighting each other. So there wasn't necessarily a lot of good ops during that time period. Yeah. Uh, you briefly mentioned the PDO. Have mm -hmm. you done much um, research on that and how that affects the background state? Yeah, and so in general, when the PDO is cold, so basically that would be warm off the coast of Japan, um, extending to the Central Pacific, and then kind of cold off of California down to the subtropical North Pacific, 
that tends to be associated with a period where you you have a harder time getting El Nino events because you tend to get a stronger subtropical high in the Pacific, in the Eastern and Central Pacific, and that tends to drive strong trades. So you can, and we did last year, but you got to hit it with a real hammer to get it to go. And then the PDO is still cold, so that's why we're seeing one of the reasons probably we're seeing a pretty quick flip back to the strong trades because when you have a La Nina and you have the cold PDO, like we, like the trade winds. If you were classifying trade wind surges, it was a category five plus, and it was just like screaming trades for years on end. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's a, that can play a big difference, I think, in the Pacific. So, when the PDO is negative overall, that would tend to be more conducive for Atlantic hurricane seasons overall in general. There's probably a relationship between the two. It gets a little fuzzier when you start. We just don't have a ton of twenty to thirty year periods to go back looking at the PDO, but. Um, I would think in general, yes, when the PDO is negative, that's when things are more, much more conducive for Atlantic hurricanes. Not for due to the fact that it's hard to get El Nino in those situations, but also it tends to also basically, if you're if you're getting subsidence over the subtropical and into the tropical Pacific, that tends to, you're going to get air going up in the Atlantic in general and we're in response and that's good for hurricanes. Uh, and while a follow-up question, sure. I noticed that you don't use any U.S. models in your, your, your seasonal forecast. Mm -hmm. Is that... <laughs> A, because you don't want to talk early, you don't want to be too close to what NSF is doing, or B, because they're not very good. Um, so on Copernicus, there's a CFS, and yeah. it was the worst performing model of all the models Wait, for Copernicus. So. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it's, not, it's not good. <laughs> yeah, no, no. So we use the European Center, JMA, UK, Met, and then there's actually um, a model in Italy that we use as well. Um, in general, they correlate pretty highly. CFS just definitely really struggled with getting... It's a 15-year-old model. Yeah, it, it definitely needs it. It's, 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 it's like my 2011 car it needs an upgrade soon. So yeah, CFSR or CFS definitely needs an upgrade. Thanks. Sure. Looks like we got a question online. Uh, Tom, do you want to go ahead and ask? Yes, and uh, my question is, do you notice any correlation between Atlantic uh, hurricane number and the Pacific uh, Ocean hurricane number? Yeah, so you really do, the, the signal is strongest between the Atlantic and the Eastern North Pacific. It's actually pretty, it's it's pretty strong, especially in recent years. And I think, you know, if you go back further, the relationship wasn't noted. And I think it's because prior to when the Hurricane Center took over the Eastern North Pacific, the, the data for there was kind of marginal. Uh, but since 88, when the Hurricane Center's done both, you do see a pretty strong negative correlation between the two. So when the Atlantic goes up, the Eastern North Pacific goes down and vice versa. Um, a lot of it, goes back to this ENSO relationship. So the Atlantic in general is a westerly shear regime. So El Nino puts more westerly shear in, and that tends to increase your shear. Whereas the Eastern North Pacific, a lot of it is a, an easterly shear regime, such that when you have westerly shear, that actually a westerly shear anomaly actually reduces your shear in the Eastern North Pacific. Uh, we also do see a relationship between the Atlantic and the Western North Pacific. Um, in general, the Atlantic and Western North Pacific are also negatively correlated, but the signal is a bit weaker because there's, frankly, you're just you're just further afield, and there's other stuff that goes into the Western North Pacific. But in general, there's still somewhat of a negative correlation just because the you know, the the Western North Pacific also tends to get more frequent storm activity in El Nino, especially as you get stronger. So if you're looking at typhoons or super typhoons versus just you know the number of named storms. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Going back to your uh, hurricane forecasts. Uh, I know you talked a lot about the science, and frankly so, but do you have any success stories from companies like private companies, uh, private sector that have to use that inf use your information to for some sort of action to prepare for a higher than normal season or a world lower than normal season? Like, have you, do you have any examples of companies that have used their? Yeah, so I mean, I think you know, from a seasonal perspective, I don't think there's a ton that they can do. I mean, I mean, I've talked to you know. To various like FEMA and all these different groups, but I'm not sure. I mean, more I think we also do subseasonal forecasts where we go like looking out two weeks, and I think that's where that kind of stuff becomes more useful because instead of saying, "Hey, the basin looks busy," or the western half of the basin looks busy, if you're looking out two weeks, you could say, "Hey, you know, dynamical models are spinning up something in 10 to 12 days." And last year we actually did have a good success because we put out a forecast around the 18th, 19th of August, and we said the next two weeks look super busy. The biggest concern is likely something potentially coming out of the uh, Western Caribbean, Southern Gulf in about 10 days. No idea where it's going to go, but if something's forming there, that's not good. Um, and that turned out to be Dahlia. So I think that's really 
we try to have the tiers, and I did actually have a, a guy from one, of the, from one of the private forecasting companies email me and tell me those were super helpful. Was trying to kind of, I think, as you get closer to the events, you can start to get a lot more than just, hey, the basin looks busy, to like, okay, this particular region looks busy, or, you know, the next two weeks look busy, but all the storms are going to be out to sea, or, you know, nothing, looks like nothing's happened in the next couple of weeks. And so that's, I think, where we try to kind of have like a suite of products where we have like the seasonal forecast, but then trying to kind of go in and fine tune. Um, once you get closer into, you know, trying to pinpoint when during the season things are going to be busiest and not only how much, but also kind of more where, because um, obviously that's what everyone really wants to know. Um, in terms of use, I think primary insurance, not a ton, more reinsurance might use it a little bit. I can tell you there's a lot of discussion, not just from our forecast, but from everyone else's forecast for this season. Uh, there's a lot of angst about the 2024 season, just given how every single group doing seasonal forecasts is going through the roof high. Um, so I think there is, you know, I don't know exactly what that's going to do, but I think there is certainly a lot of, certainly a lot of interest in the 2024 season. And we'll definitely have a lot of explaining to do if it's a season with two hurricanes. <laughs> so over the last several years, we've seen a lot of tropical cyclones with really crazy rapid intensification, some projected, some overachieving projections. Would you say that with the, uh, the trend in increasing temperatures in the ocean waters that we might see more of that in the future. So would there be an increasing trend in those rapidly intensifying storms? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's what, you know, it's kind of what we were showing earlier was when you go to like the really high intensity, high intensification rate thresholds, you start to see um, a, a significant trend. So it's not like in the 40 knots or 40 to 50 knots in the day, but 60 knots in the day are even higher, like the really high intensity events. And we're seeing it not only with intensification, but also weakening. The storms just tend to be more volatile. We saw that last year with Hurricane Lee, where it basically blew up way faster than everyone thought, and then just didn't fall, completely fall apart. It went from Cat 5 to Cat 2, you know, seemingly for almost, I mean, there was some southwest release here, but seemingly for almost no good reason. It went, went down almost as fast as it came up. Um, and so I think that's one of the things we're likely to see more of with climate change, is more of these kind of vol vol volatile storms, where they're going up and going down. Um, certainly the forecasts of rapid intensification have improved a lot in the last 10 to 15 years, which is extremely important, especially if we do start seeing more of these. Uh, but obviously, as we saw last year with Hurricane Otis, you know, not always. There's cases where the storms just take everybody by surprise. Um, and so, you know, the more, and also too, one of the things that will beat the drum on is, you know, the more aircraft we come, we can get the better because they fly planes in Otis till the day before it made landfall because none of the models really showed it doing all that much. And when they flew it, the temperature, I think the pressure dropped 12 millibars in an hour and a half. It was an insane pressure drop. Um, but obviously, had they flown it the day before, maybe they would have found stuff that was a lot more interesting than what it looked like. But it's hard because the Atlantic will fly pretty much anything, but the Eastern North Pacific is a long way to go. If the models say something, then they'll fly it. But if the models don't, so it's one of those things where we didn't fly it because the models didn't say much was going to happen. And you can remove data from the model easily enough. You can say, okay, say we did have the aircraft data in the model, how would it have done? But you can't really do the other way. We don't know what it looked like. And maybe it would have done nothing, but you know, really trying to get ground truth models or aircraft truth models as opposed to I mean satellite data is great, but get more aircraft data in there would be probably really helpful as well. Thank you. Really great discussion. I can tell. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was just curious. So the latest study on the Atlantic uh, Meridian overturn current. How, what's your influence uh, how that would impact future variables? <laughs> yeah, and so this is something, you know, I haven't talked a ton about this. The, uh, the So Dr. Gray was a big fan of this positive negative phase of this Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, or as you mentioned, the Atlantic running all over turning circulation. And so, you know, the, the kind of the canonical view is that when the far north Atlantic goes cold, then eventually the tropical Atlantic should also go cold and usually acquire the hurricane seasons. And if we look at this trend in sea surface temperatures since 1990, uh, we see a nice big cold blob in the far north Atlantic, and yet the tropical Atlantic is warming in the merry way. Um, and so that's, it's kind of broken. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure why. There's definitely been periods in the past where the far north Atlantic and the tropical Atlantic have, the correlation has gotten very weak. Normally, the adage is that when you have cold water in the northern Atlantic, that should tend to basically um, like be warm in the tropics, colder in the colder in the mid latitudes and high latitudes. That should increase your jet streams, which should eventually mean a stronger North Atlantic oscillation, stronger, higher pressure, and cooling the tropical Atlantic. And it 
it's worked okay in the winter and just falling apart in the summer. Um, and so I, I don't really know exactly how that's going to trend. Because I can tell you, we published a paper at the end of 2015, and it was published as active Atlantic hurricane era at its end with a question mark. And I'm glad we put it in the question mark. <laughs> the answer has been emphatic, no. Um, so yeah, there's definitely still a lot of work I think that needs to be looked at as to why kind of that normal chain that if I had talked here in 2016, I thought I'm going to put up, here's the chain of events and it was working great. And then hasn't worked and so I don't, I don't know, I don't know exactly what's going on there. Thanks. Well, thank you all, a great discussion. And uh, if anyone is interested in talking more with Phil, uh, he'll be around tomorrow as well. Uh, reach out to me, I'll see if I can get it on the schedule. But thank you again. Thanks.